today, the, the title of the message is Symphony. And, and we'll get into what that means here in just a second. But Philippians chapter 2, verse 1, verses 1 through 11 is our scripture focus today. I'm going to read that, and then we're going to show that video, Tom, that intro video. This, again, this is Paul writing. He says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, any fellowship with the Spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. We pray you bring that, that word to life once more today. Lord, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to receive all that you have. And God, I pray for your anointing upon my words that I speak only what you desire me to speak. Nothing more, nothing less. Help me to convey your word accurately, Lord, to, to rightly divide your word today. And we pray, God, that we would leave this place different than when we came in, having encountered you in some way today. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul then turns to the Philippians, and he urges them to participate in Jesus' example by taking up this same mindset. He says, your life as citizens should be consistent with the good news about the Messiah. So these Christians in Philippi, they were living in a hotbed of Roman patriotism, but their way of life was to be shaped by another king, Jesus. And that might bring persecution, but they are not to be afraid because suffering for being associated with Jesus, it's a way of living out the story of Jesus himself. Which leads Paul into the great poem of chapter 2. It's rich with echoes of Old Testament texts, specifically the story of Adam and his rebellion in Genesis 1-3, through and the poems about the suffering servant in the book of Isaiah. This poem is worth committing to memory. It is a beautifully condensed version of the gospel story. So before becoming human, the Messiah pre-existed in a state of glory and equality with God. And unlike Adam, who tried to seize equality with God, the Messiah chose not to exploit his equal status for his self-advantage. Rather, he emptied himself of status. He became a human. He became a servant to all. And even more than that, he allowed himself to be humiliated. He was obedient to the Father by going to his death on a Roman execution rack. But through God's power and grace, the Messiah's shameful death has been reversed through the resurrection. And now God has highly exalted Jesus as the King of all, bestowing upon him the name that is above all names, so that all creation should recognize that Jesus the Messiah is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now that last statement is astounding. Paul's quoting from Isaiah chapter 45. It's a passage where all creation comes to recognize the God of Israel as Lord. Paul's point here is very clear. In the crucified and risen Jesus, we discover that the one true God of Israel consists of God the Father and the Lord Jesus. And so for Paul, this poem, it expresses his convictions about who Jesus is, and it does more. It offers the example of Jesus as a way of life that his followers are to imitate. And so this chapter, chapter 2, is really kind of the the center, right, that poem that they just talked about, which we will address today, is the center of Paul's letter, and everything else kind of, um, you know, spokes off of that. And so today, the title of the message, like I said, is Symphony. And in verse 3, when Paul writes, do nothing out of selfish ambition, or I'm sorry, the end of verse 2, he says, be like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. And the Greek word for that phrase, one in spirit, is the word sympsychos. 
Um, doesn't mean to be psychotic, but it means to be of one mind, of one purpose. And so this, this idea of symphony just uh, kind of came to me as I was studying this picture of a symphony. I was, I was a band geek. I was in band and concert band and marching band, competitive marching band. Um, I almost sought to, to uh, sign up with a marching drum corps, you know, the profession. Like, I was really into it. Uh, our band was good, and we competed. And so we, you know, a lot of the field trips we would take were to go watch symphonies, concert bands, you know, because we were, our, our director wanted to enrich us with great music and, and great, you know, great uh, performances. And if you think of a symphony, you may not be into those things, but you probably all know what a symphony is. A symphony has all kinds of different uh, people, instruments, different parts that play different notes, different chords, but they're all playing one song. And so not all, they're not all playing the exact same thing, but when they're mixed together, when they're doing their part correctly, and the other people are doing their part correctly, it brings this beautiful sound. And if you're moved by music, when you hear things like that, it just kind of, you know, sometimes you have those moments, you're like, whoa, like you can feel the emotion of that music. The problem is, when it, you know, as the body of Christ, we are to be a symphony for God. You know, that song says that he is writing a symphony through the chaos. Well, the chaos is because of humanity. God didn't cause the chaos, but through it, it says he's writing a symphony, and you and I are the members of that symphony. And if you do your part, and if I do my part, and we do our part correctly, the way we're supposed to, it's going to be this beautiful sound, this beautiful message. And yes, not everyone will get it. Not everyone will be moved by it because they don't understand, but many will. The problem is we often don't sound like we're supposed to. Too often today, we might sound like this, number one. Too often, that's what, now they're trying to play the right notes. They're trying to play and it just doesn't sound right. Now, when it's younger kids, you kind of, oh, you know, you might clap. But if there were trained musicians, expert musicians, and it sounded like that, you would ask for your money back if you went to that show. You're like, what in the world is this? And see, here's the thing. It's not just about playing bad, you know, playing bad notes. If this group was a, was a symphony and you guys all played a song in the key of G, and we played the same song, but we played it in the key of A, and you played the same song, but you played it in the key of D flat, that you might all play your notes perfectly. But if we're playing in different keys, it's going to sound like that. And so too often today, people might be playing and you know, they think they're playing well. It's like, well, it sounds good to me, but they're playing in the wrong key. Because you don't get to determine the key. I don't get to determine what key. The one who writes the symphony says, this is the key of the message. This is the key of the song. And that composer is not you or me, but it's God. Now... Even, in, even singing in or playing in unison, if we all play the exact same notes, the exact same key, it, it would be nice, but it wouldn't quite be the same. And so if we're all just playing the same notes and we're singing and playing in unison, it might sound something like this. Light of the world, we step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say. Sounds nice. It's one voice singing the melody. We could all sing the same melody. It would sound nice. It's a pretty song. That would be much better. It'd, it'd be much better for us to all say and do the same thing, 
than to all be doing different things that don't mesh. But the goal of the gospel is not uniformity, that everyone looks the same, acts the same, talks the same, has the same job. We all have different roles, and when they come together and everyone's doing their different part, there's so much depth and beauty to the gospel message that it's supposed to sound something like this. You step down into darkness, open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you, hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to worship. Say that you're my guide, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days, oh, so highly exalted. sin upon that cross and I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin I know we've watched a lot of videos. The point was to illustrate this so that you get the picture. There's a, there's a big difference in how that kind of arrangement is received than one person or even a big group of people singing the same notes in the same key. Now, it's better to do that than to all be in the wrong key and wrong notes, right? But there's something different about that kind of arrangement where sometimes you're... you're, you're preaching or you're portraying the same message but using different notes, different parts of that where it comes across more richly and more, more deep and more beautiful. There's, you know, when you listen to music, there are times where you hear things that's like, it, you know, you feel the emotions of it. When the gospel is being preached the right way, everyone is fulfilling their specific role. You're not to do what I do. I'm not to do what you do. Don't ever think that what you do, so well, this, I, I'm not a pastor, I'm not a, it doesn't matter. 
If you're a sanitation worker, then you do that as unto God. You work, you work in that environment and you carry yourself as I am a representative of Jesus in this position and I'm going to do everything I can to advance the gospel. Even if you feel like the job you do doesn't have meaning, you have meaning and God wants to use you wherever you are to advance the gospel. And so the goal is for us to be this beautiful symphony speaking and, and, and living and portraying the love of Christ. Where when people hear it, they're not drawn in by shame or guilt, but they're drawn in by beauty. They're drawn in by something that moves them. We've all had those moments, most, I hope all of us, but at least most of us I know have had those moments with God where you're just drawn in by something beautiful that just causes you to maybe to weep or just to stop and that you have no words to say but to just experience what's going on. This is how the gospel is supposed to sound. Now again, not everyone will appreciate, even when it sounds well, some will say, oh, I'm not into that kind of stuff. That, that's, we can't do anything about that. God's in, in, in charge of all of that. But we're called to do our part and to do our part with excellence, to do our part well, to do our part that reflects accurately Jesus and his love and his message. And so Paul is calling the Philippians to this type of unity. Now it seems impossible to get four or five people to do a song like that, yeah, you can do that. But how do you get millions of people to walk and live in such a way that it's this beautiful symphony? It seems impossible, doesn't it? And Paul understands that too, but he tells them exactly what they need to do. Right, there's, a, there's an old saying in, in rabbinic teaching that says, if you have two rabbis, you likely have three opinions. And it probably, you know, you can say the same about church today. If you have two pastors, you have three opinions. That sometimes we, you know, we have our own version, our own thoughts of what the gospel should be, how it should be portrayed, how it should be preached. And we focus so much on things that in the end don't really matter, that it muddies what the gospel is supposed to sound like and how it's supposed to be received by people. But the answer, according to Paul, to the question, how is this type of unity possible? Everyone must be focused on something other than themselves. He says there in, in verse 3, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Now that should, a better translation is to consider your others before yourselves. Not to say, well, that person's better than me. That's not what that's saying. But to consider them before yourself. To consider their needs and their thoughts and their, um, their life before yours. Now, if we're all doing that, that means someone else is considering your life before theirs. And so we're all being taken care of in the right way. We're all doing what we're supposed to be doing, but only when we focus on something other than ourselves. And yes, it's God, but it's also other people. And so it's about finding our part in this symphony, our voice within this gospel symphony. And Paul speaks of the motivation. He says, you should want to live this way. He said, each of you should look not to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. You should want to be like-minded. You should want to be to be in, in, in connection through the Spirit of Christ. Like if you're encouraged from being united with Him, if you're comforted by His love, if you have any fellowship with His Spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then be like-minded, be of one heart, be of one purpose, be of one spirit. Be a symphony of voices, be a symphony of, of gospel preachers. We're united first and foremost with Jesus, we understand that. But then we're also called to be united with one another. Being like-minded, in other words, having the, the mind of Christ is what helps us to be like-minded with one another. Having the same love, having the same spirit, having the same mindset. And even there where it says to have the same love, that, that Greek word is echo. 
So you can think of it, we're to echo what Jesus does. An echo doesn't change, it just it gives the same, it reflects the same thing back to it. So we should echo who Jesus is, echo his words. It's not our version of it, but to echo the gospel. To be in one accord, to be connected like a symphony. But there are varying types of unity, aren't there? Because thieves, terrorists, people committing adultery together, they can be united. They're of the same mindset, they're of the same purpose, but that purpose is the wrong purpose. And so we have to be careful that just because, like, wow, I think the same way as these people, we're united, but are you united, are you united with the right message? That's where people are doing the same song in different keys. It's like, wait a minute, there's something off here. It's a single-mindedness, not just with one another, or even primarily with one another, but with Christ and the gospel, that's where it starts. Being of one mind is no good if all of our thinking is out of line with the gospel. There's a lot of people who are of one mind that did irreparable damage to others. There are a lot of people who have been united around dangerous, violent things. So it's that unity with Christ first that echoes through us. But then each of us has different gifts and talents and abilities and personalities because they're designed to mesh like a symphony, to not just parrot the same thing, but to work together with Christ and build this beautiful symphony of, of gospel voices. The love that we have must be the love that the gospel generates and sustains. The unity we have must be the unity that the gospel generates and sustains. The foundation for Christians is and always has been and always will be Christ and his gospel. We get so bogged down with secondary things that in the end don't really matter as much. And we lose our foundation. The foundation is Jesus Christ and him crucified and his gospel. And so it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Not our faith, but the perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Now we see a picture of a symphony. We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. He said, because you are surrounded by others who have gone before you, by others who, who continue to support you and, and be part of this symphony with you, run with perseverance the race marked out for you. Not someone else's race, not someone else's role. The race marked out for you. And the key is right there, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. We might be the symphony, but Jesus is both the composer of the message and the conductor. So he's the one that wrote the message and he's the one that conducts the message and says, eyes up here. Move with me. No, and he tells you when it's your turn to come in. Like right now he's conducting and it's just these voices and then it's just these and, and then it's now we're, now we're coming together. He is the one we must fix our eyes upon. And how do we do this? Again, going back to verses three and four, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. That phrase, selfish ambition, in the Greek means electioneering, intriguing for office, a desire to advance oneself, a partisan and fractious spirit. Ambition is not wrong, but selfish ambition to promote yourself, to promote your brand, to promote your version. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition that, that's about advancing your version or yourself, but instead to advance the gospel of Jesus. Instead, in humility, value others before yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each to the interests of others. 
We have to look at one another and, and even those outside of the church with the assumption that everyone else and their needs are more important than me and my needs. That's hard to do in a culture that is built upon my individual rights and my individual freedoms. But Jesus calls us to look to the, the needs of others as more important than ours. Because that's what he did. Because I trust God to meet my needs, because you trust God to meet your needs, we should not need to depend on other people or anyone else to meet those, for, meet those needs for us. Whether it's our security, our comfort, our peace, our identity, it should be found in Jesus. And if I trust God in all those areas, I don't need someone else to provide those for me. Even in my marriage, I should not be expecting Missy to provide me my identity and to, to do this for me and to do that for me. That should come from the Lord. Then I can freely give of myself to her. And the same with her. If she has that same mindset, she can freely give of herself to me. And our marriage is going to be healthy and strong and growing because we both surrendered first and foremost to Jesus, which allows us to surrender then to one another. So again, this is impossible unless our eyes are fixed on Jesus and the gospel. And in that, that Hebrews passage where it says fix, it means to consider attentively, to lock in on. So you lock in on Jesus and nothing takes you away. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe uh, thinking of this song will, will help you to remember this passage. It's just too good to be true. I can't take my eyes off of you. You're like heaven to touch. Oh, I want to hold you so much. That long last love has arrived. And I thank God I'm alive. You're just too good to be true. I can't take my eyes off of you. She is so embarrassed right now. <laughs> but the whole idea is you are fixing your eyes on Jesus. It's like, I can't take my eyes off of you. You are too good to be true. Whatever I need, it's in you, God. I don't care what's going on here. I don't care what's going on over here. I don't care what's going on back there. I'm fixed on you because you are the only one that can give me what I need. You're the only one who has everything I need. But too often, we, we get distracted. We get pulled away. And we don't fix our eyes on Jesus. We're not locked in on Jesus. We allow the things of the world to pull us away from that. We all do it. And we have missed this so much. The church throughout history has missed this so much. And I think we are missing it so much right now throughout the world. We should be drawn into repentance and forgiveness, committing ourselves to getting it right, committing ourselves to fixing our eyes on Jesus, his gospel, and his creation. Or for the sake of Jesus and his gospel and his creation. It takes less than a minute to look around us and know that there's brokenness. And there's a lot of people, a lot of Christians, because I've heard them say it. They're like, man, I don't, like they just, I don't say they lost hope, but they're losing hope. Like, I don't think we'll ever get this back. I don't think it'll ever be the same again. I don't think, there's this fear that because of what's going on around us that somehow the gospel's going to lose its effectiveness. Or that somehow God isn't going to be as present. And we're selling God short because we're not fixing our eyes on him. Instead, we're fixing our eyes on the earthly kingdom. And so Paul begins this little section, tells them you need to stay united, you think of one another before yourselves, and then he breaks into song. Just like I broke into song there, right? Sometimes you, you go throughout life and you just have a moment where you kind of, man, you just want to break out in song. Maybe you break out in dance. He's breaking out in song here with this, this poem from verses 6 to 11, this Christ poem, this Messiah hymn. And it's really all about what it means to fix your eyes on Jesus and to have the mind of Christ. See, in Paul's day, when people thought of heroic leaders and rulers and kings, they often thought of leaders like Alexander the Great. 
right, back in the 300s BC uh, in Greece. Or in Paul's time, the Roman Emperor Augustus, who put an end to the Roman Civil War and brought about called the Pax Romana, right, or the Roman Peace, the Peace of Rome. Both were regarded as divine figures, but they had military strength, they had organizational skills. And so when people thought of heroes, when they thought of rulers, even when they thought of the Messiah, this is the picture they had in mind. But the gospel sets Jesus up as so counter-cultural to this. He ruled not as a warrior, not even as an intellectual. I mean, he was certainly wise and smart, but he, he ruled not as a great administrator, but he ruled as a servant. He ruled as one that washed feet. He ruled as one that, that spent time with the least of these, that went out of his way to dine with others that the religious leaders had cast away. He ruled as one who surrendered his own rights, his authority, his power, and ultimately his life for other people. Mark chapter 10 Verse 42, I think you've got this up here. But in Mark chapter 10, you have the story of James and John. Their mother comes to Jesus and they say, Hey, Jesus, or she says, I, I want my sons to be at your right and left hands. Right? When everything's said and done, I want them to sit at your right and your left, and, and I want them to be up there with you. And Jesus, being the gentleman he is, he's like, Yeah, you don't really know what you're asking. The other disciples get mad when they find out. I mean, you would too if you were one of them. Hey, what are you trying to do? And Jesus says this to them. He called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them, but not so with you. You are not to be that way. Instead, he says, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so Paul's hearkening back to Jesus' own words. From the beginning, humanity desired to be like God. Adam and Eve, they were convinced that God was holding back on them. Cain wanted to be God. He wanted to exert authority. It's like, no, I'll just get rid of the problem. I'll kill my brother. Those who lived before the flood, the Tower of Babel. It's all about people wanting to make a name for themselves. Israel went the way of Adam time and time again. The Pharisees, they just on and on and on and on it goes. People wanted to be like God. They, they may not have said, I want to be like God. We don't say, I want to be God. But when we try to take control of things, that's what we're really doing, is to put ourselves in the place of God. But Paul comes to this point and he breaks out with this beautiful poem. Now some say that it, the poem already existed. Others say Paul wrote it. Doesn't matter either way. Paul was inspired to write this poem. And there's, so, there's, there's such deep theological meaning in this. And we're not going to get into all of that. But you know, last week on our Sunday night we talked about poetry and how you approach poetry and how you interpret it. And one of the things that I said was that when you approach poetry, you don't ask the question, what does the author mean by this? But you ask the question, why did the author write this in a poem? Why did the author do this? Because when you write poetry, when you write music, you're writing with emotion. You're putting, there's so much behind the lyrics. There's so much behind the words. And so you ask, why, what's going on for Paul that he began to write now in poetic form? Remember, Paul's in prison. Paul's experienced a lot of, a lot of um, persecution. But when he's thinking about Jesus, he just breaks out into this poem, this song of how beautiful Jesus is, how great Jesus is. He doesn't just say, hey, you gotta be like Jesus. And he, he, it's like he just gets away from that for a second and he reminds himself how amazing Christ is. And he says, our attitude should be the same as that of Christ. And then he breaks out, who being in very nature God, he, was, he is and was and always will be God, but he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Instead, he made himself nothing, took on the very nature of a servant, was made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient 
to death, even to death on a cross. Now, Jesus didn't stop being God when he came to the earth, when he became human. He didn't give up his divinity, right? That's why Satan tried to tempt him. He said, hey, you're God. You can do these things. Just turn that stone into bread. I just throw yourself off the building. You can command your angels. Jesus didn't lose his ability to be God. But it says he made himself nothing. And a better translation is he made himself of no reputation. For Jesus, he didn't care what his reputation was among humanity. His only purpose was to serve the mission of God, which he was part of the, the Godhead. He made himself of no reputation. He did not use his divinity to his advantage. He didn't exploit his divinity to get out of suffering, to get out of tough situations. And so what Jesus did, as Paul so eloquently describes here, is the true meaning of who God is. He is the God of self-giving. He is the God of self-sacrificial love. Hebrews chapter 1 tells us more about this when it says that Jesus is the exact representation of the Father's being. The people that came before were types, right? They, your Moseses and your Josephs, and they were all people that helped point that way, but Jesus was the exact imprint, the exact representation of the Father's being. When they saw Jesus, they saw God. And so during this time in history, Jesus played his part in the symphony. He went from being the composer and the conductor to being part of the symphony. He just sat down, picked up an instrument, and said, this is my part. And the Father continued to conduct, but Jesus was the one that led the way for us. You know, with a, with a long musical piece, you have those those movements where, you know, one movement is kind of cheery and uplifting and another is, you know, in a minor key, it's a little more, you know, a little dark. And, and so Jesus' life was like that. And then when the cross happened, you have the climax of the movement where you, you just know that this is the climax of the piece. You can, you can hear the tension. You can hear the emotion. And then the resolution is three days after the cross when Jesus was not found in that tomb but instead he was seen by the women and he was seen by the disciples and he was seen by the men walking to Emmaus. The resolution of that symphony was the resurrection. Victory was won. Life emerges. So Jesus made himself of no reputation. Therefore, in verse 9, the poem goes on, God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. So everyone, at some someday, will recognize and confess Jesus as Lord to the glory of God the Father. So because Jesus made himself of no reputation, the Father gave him a reputation. The Father exalted him. The Father glorified him. The Father made him or exalted him to the highest place giving him the name that is above all names. As I said earlier, people in Philippi and really throughout the, the known world, they had a particular idea of what God looked like or gods, those who believed in pagan gods, and how they operated with power. And that's why Alexander and Augustus fit their pictures. But Paul juxtaposes that picture with the picture of Jesus through this beautiful poem. And many, including Christ's followers, found it difficult to accept and still do today. We accept the crucifixion. We accept that Jesus died on the cross, that he resurrected. But for some reason, we have troubles accepting it at face value. And we, and we can... And maybe it's just subconscious, but we carry this belief sometimes that, well, that had, he did that so that we could have power. Jesus died so that 
But the truth is the power is the, re the, the cross, and the power is the resurrection. It's not in what they produced. If only one person started following Jesus and started believing that he was God, he still would have done what he did. Because it wasn't about what results it produced, it was about what he was supposed to do. So he went to the cross, he rose from the grave. That is where the power is. That's why Paul says in Philippians 3, verses 10 and 11, I think I have it up here. See, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. The two things that Paul said, I want to know. I want to know his death and I want to know his resurrection because that's where the power is. The power is in being able to sacrifice my life to this world and say, I don't need this world. My home is not here because I know that in doing so, I am resurrected with Christ that I, I live with a different mindset, that I have access to a different way of life. The gospel is not, never has been, and never will be about power or authority over others, but it's always been about self-giving, self-sacrificial love, regardless of what that love produces. See, that's the hard part, is we can give ourselves. Think of someone like Jeremiah. Jeremiah gave himself to the ministry of God. And very few people, I mean, showed any fruit from Jeremiah's ministry. You've probably heard stories of missionaries that they go to these foreign places for years and years and years, and nobody got saved. Then after they die, you start to see fruit. But those people continue to give themselves because it wasn't about how many numbers we had. It was simply about doing what they were called to do, fulfilling their part in the symphony of the gospel. And so our call is to be like-minded with Christ, to have that same love, to be of the same spirit and the same purpose. That only happens in humility when we value others above, before ourselves, and when we don't look to our own interests, but the interests of others. We can only do that when we have the mindset of Christ. And so what does that mean? We too must make ourselves of no reputation. It's not about what people think about us, our church, our families. It's about doing the right thing, doing what God has called us to do. Because for Jesus, it wasn't about him. It wasn't even about the people, but it was about God. He said, I only do what the Father shows me to do. Yes, he loved people, but he didn't do anything that wasn't already ordered for him to do from the Father because it was about God first and foremost. It was about that mission first and foremost. He took on the nature of a servant. When he washed their feet in John chapter 13, and the disciples were like, what are you doing? You shouldn't be doing this. What did Jesus say to them? Now that you've seen me do this, you need to go do the same thing. He wasn't telling them literally to go wash people's feet. He was saying, you need to take that same mindset that you're willing to do anything. No matter how dirty, not you go do something dirty, but no matter how dirty the feet are of the people you're serving, you serve them anyway. You love them anyway. You give of yourself anyway because your reward is not here on earth anyway. Your reward is with me and in following me. He humbled himself by becoming obedient even to death on the cross. And I truly believe if only one person had believed Jesus was God, he would not have changed his mission or made his death and resurrection a failure. And when you take that attitude, God's the one that exalts. And let me tell you, you would much rather be exalted by God than by this world. You'd much rather be exalted by God than this world. And so we must also make ourselves of no reputation, put our lives in God's hands, and understand that it's not about the results, but it's simply about being obedient to the part that I'm supposed to play and that you're supposed to play. But in doing so, I am confident that the results will be much better and greater and long-lasting than we could ever hope or imagine. 
Because God is God. And you and I are not. So the gospel calls us to newness, to start over with Christ as our foundation, to rethink our whole picture of God, and also to rethink our picture of this world, of other people. This is and always will be challenging. But God is known most clearly in Jesus, who abandoned his rights for the sake of the world, for the sake of the gospel. And we must do the same if we are to be truly united with Christ, comforted by his love, connected through the Spirit, which results in tenderness and compassion for one another and for those around us. I want you to close your eyes for a moment. If you're here today and you've never, you know, I'm talking about how Jesus emptied himself for, for us to show us who God was. And if you're here today and you say, man, I've never, I've never made the decision to believe this. Maybe I do believe it, but I've just kind of, there's something about, you know, when God in, invites us, the Bible says that when we accept that invitation, all of heaven rejoices. But there's something about just making some kind of outward movement, even just a simple thing of raising your hand and saying, I acknowledge that I've been living for myself, and today I want that to change. I don't want to live for myself anymore, for my rights, for my... I want to live my part in the symphony of the gospel by acknowledging today that Jesus is God. If that's you and you would just raise a hand, I'm not going to make anyone stand up or thank you. The second question I would ask is, you, so you've already made that decision and you, you know that you, you know, you've, you've committed to follow Christ and, and to, to live a life that, that hopefully reflects him. But you also understand that where you are right now, so man, it's, I've let that slip. Doesn't mean that now you're on a road to hell but it just means that you recognize I've let that slip and I've allowed my, myself to get so drawn into the chaos of the world around me. And I need to follow in the ways of Christ and make myself of no reputation. And it's not about me. It's not about what I want to see. And, and I trust that if I do that, that God will start to do things around me. God will start to in, invade this world in a good way. But I don't want to try to take it into my own hands because I know that doesn't work. And so I want to repent today of doing that. I want to recommit myself to following his ways, to making myself of no reputation. If that's you, you just raise a hand. Thank you, a handful of us. And you can open your eyes. So how do you do that? I wish I could give you three steps. There's only one step, but it is so hard. That one step in making this possible is you have to surrender yourself. You've got to take all of your, all of your frustrations, you've got to take all the things you want to see, and you've got to say, God, doesn't matter. All that matters is you. All that matters is the gospel. I want to play my part in the symphony of the gospel. And you can't do that until you surrender. You can't play in the key that you want. Jesus wrote the peace. Jesus conducts the peace. You have to, we have to follow his lead. And until we do, we're going to continue to have this, just this tension. And look, we're not perfect. We're, we're, we're always going to run into this to some extent. But it's about daily surrendering ourselves. That's, when, that's why Jesus says, you die to yourself daily. Right? It's, not, it's not like getting rid of yourself, but it's saying, Lord, it's not about me today. I have a, a prayer on my phone that I opened up and I started to pray every day that basically says that, God, this day is yours, this church is yours, these people are yours, they're not mine. You've put me in this place, you've put me in this position, and God, I want to do what you want me to do, so I give it to you. I give these people to you, I give this church to you, I give my family to you, I give my day to you. And it's just a simple thing to help me remember this is God's, it's not about me. So we're going to play that song, that Here I Am to Worship song again. And these altars are open if you want to come forward and pray. If you want to stay, whatever you, whatever you feel led to do, we're going to take just those few minutes to allow for a response. And when that song's done, I'm just going to 
when you feel ready to go, you can feel ready to go. I'm not going to come up and do an official closing. Uh, I'll just stick around if someone wants prayer. Uh, but I'm going to pray right now. Lord, you saw the hands. You saw what was going on um, in people's hearts and why they responded. Lord, and I pray that for those that, Lord, that you, you desire to step out or to do something, that, God, you just draw them in. Even if it's just right where they are, that they just make an acknowledgement and say, God, I need to surrender myself today. And I, I encourage us, God, to, to voice exactly what those things are. To not just make it a generic prayer, but to say, God, I need to lay this down. I need to lay this down. God, I need to lay my marriage down. God, I need to lay my job down. Lord, I need to lay this down. And I want to play my part in your symphony. God, I'm so thankful for each and every uh, man and woman and child that is here today because they have such a, a crucial part to play. God, they have their own part in your symphony to play. And I pray that you, you help them to see that, God, to embrace that, to play their part with passion and with excellence and, and to give of themselves to that part. They're not called to be someone else, to do someone else's part, but to simply do their part. Help them to find that, God, because then their passion will grow, their experience of you will grow. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we give you all glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.